Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. We'll begin there in just a moment. Luke chapter 11. We want to welcome all of our visitors and invite you back anytime that you have the opportunity to come back with us. If you have any questions about what we say or do here at this place, please feel free to ask us after services. We would love to to get to know you better and and give an explanation for why we do the things that we do, why why the... while we say things the way we say them. Luke chapter 11, just to give you a a quick reminder about this context, we studied this, I I believe it was on March 6th in Bible class. Jesus is a dinner guest at a Pharisee's house, and he's not doing a very guestly thing. He's lambasting the person that invited him to dinner. And not only the person that invited him to dinner, but all of his buddies, the Pharisees. And then a lawyer pops up in verse 45 and says, One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, and saying these things, You insult us too. Don't you know you're stepping on our toes too? And without missing a beat, he starts lambasting the lawyers. Woe to you lawyers also. But in this series of woes to the Pharisees and lawyers here in Luke chapter 11, the most confusing to me is in verse 47 and verse 48. Woe to you! You build the tombs of the prophets, whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Wait a second. Why is building a tomb for a prophet a bad thing? That doesn't make much sense to me. When I think of building tombs for people, I immediately think of building a monument for somebody. That seems to me to be more like an honor than it is a disrespect. And yet he says in verse 48, because of what you're doing with this tomb building business, you witness and you consent to the murder of the prophets. What is Jesus saying here? It's possible, I think, and I say possible, I wouldn't be dogmatic about this. It is possible that Jesus is using a figure of speech. They had this figure of speech in the first century among the Jews about entombing somebody or burying somebody. And we have the same figure of speech. Have you ever heard in the sport realm, in the sporting realm, we're going to bury these guys? It's fourth quarter time. Let's bury them. Let's entomb them. Or a prosecutor will say about somebody that they're trying to put away in jail, we're going to bury them. And it means to suppress the influence of, right? We're going to bury these guys. And I wonder if that's what Jesus is saying. Your fathers killed them, and you do nothing but suppress the influence of the prophets. You don't hold up their message. You keep the prophets down. Whether that's what Jesus is saying or not, What I want you to see is that it doesn't matter if they weren't the ones committing the violent act. Jesus is holding them responsible for supporting the violence. Does everyone see that? You see, a Pharisee could say, well, I I didn't murder Jeremiah or Elisha or whoever it was. I didn't personally murder them. But Jesus says, what you're doing right now is supporting the violence against these prophets. Hang on to that. And go to Obadiah. I'll give you a minute to find it. I've got the page memorized in my Bible, so I'm going to find it pretty easily. Obadiah. There's a passage here in Obadiah in verse 10 and 11 where God has an oracle for the Edomites. And God is going to tell these Edomites, I'm holding you responsible for supporting the violence against Jerusalem. And yet the the Edomites weren't the violent ones. Look at verse 10 and 11 of Obadiah. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Verse 11. On the day that you stood aloof. You see, God is holding them responsible for what they didn't do, not what they did. They weren't the ones invading Jerusalem, but they weren't the ones helping either. On the day that you stood aloof, verse 11, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. 
Because of what you didn't do, you are like the violent people. Look at verse 14. Oh, they did something, actually. You know what they did? As, as people were fleeing Jerusalem, they were capturing these fugitives and then handing them back over to Jerusalem's invaders. Look at verse 14. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives, that being Jerusalem. Do not, do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. Isn't that a very similar point to what Jesus is making in Luke chapter 11? That even if you aren't the one, even though you aren't the one committing the violent act, your actions now support the violence. I'm seeing heads nod in agreement. Is everyone ready to keep nodding their head? I hope so. Because this lesson is about abortion. We can pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I, I don't personally work at an abortion clinic. I don't personally take the lives of the unborn. But are you, brethren, a tomb builder? Are you a tomb builder? Supporting people who are pro-abortion. Supporting groups who are pro-abortion. It's time that we stop dancing around this issue. Because it is possible that though we are pro-life mentally, figuratively, we're building tombs. And I don't want to be caught grave digging. So let's talk about this. The subject of abortion is actually rather simple. Is what is in the womb, is the baby in the womb a human being? You know, it's hard to preach on something so simple, but simple topics I like. <laughs> My brain isn't that big. I, I can't handle the big ones. This is, is what it comes down to, isn't it? Is, is what is in the womb a human being? And if you are in agreement that what is in the womb is a human being, then the subject is done. Because everyone, including atheists, including unbelievers, including people who do not respect the scripture, they all understand this special inherent right of mankind, right to life. Did you see recently Bernie Sanders was doing a town hall? And he was talking about free health care for everybody. And he was talking about free health care as if it were a human right. A right to have health care. And the guy that was doing the moderating, he asked Bernie, he said, Sir, where did this right come from? And he said, in being a human being. And there was this great applause and feel the burn or whatever they say. Now, whether health care is a human right or not, we could debate that. But do you get it? Everybody understands that there is a special inherent right in being a human being. We don't give these rights to animals, to the gazelle that is killed by a lion, to two dogs getting in a fight in a back alley and one of them dies. We don't give these rights. We don't hunt down a lion that kills a gazelle. Listen to this. Everyone has a right to life. That is Article 3 from the Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the UN came out with in 1948. What I want you to underline in your mind is everyone, everyone has a right to life. And what I'm showing you is, is that the unbelieving world gets it. That human beings have this right. Listen to this. This is from our Constitution, the 14th Amendment. Nor shall any state deprive any person, underlining your mind, any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Everyone and any person. That sounds pretty broad, doesn't it? But this isn't a civics class. All I bring these things up for is to show you that people who don't respect the scripture get this right. Where did this right come from? It came from God. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 1. 
Genesis chapter 1, and let's read about the right to life. No, the phrase isn't used here, but God will use this passage as a way of saying, yes, the way I created human beings is a right to life. Here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, listen to this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, a skeptic reading closely might say, Alan, that's not saying that everyone has a right to life as clearly as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. That's not saying it as clearly as you want it to. And yet God uses it that clearly. Because when God authorizes the death penalty for taking human life, when you take the right to life away from somebody, God says, by man, your blood shall be shed. And guess what the Lord quotes as the reason? Well, read it for yourself. Go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. When God brings up the death penalty, he quotes the reason why you should be punished for taking away the right to life for somebody. Here it is in verse 6, Genesis chapter 9. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. For God made man in his own image. There it is. That's right to life. Not because the UN said so or the Constitution says so, but because God says so. And unbelievers get this because we give human beings different rights than we give the animal kingdom or the plant world or whatever other kind of life you might bring up. So we haven't even answered the question yet. Is what is in the womb a human being? Well, I'm going to put three statistics up on the board that show individuality and life before fetus viability. Now, I'll go over each of these things that are in the title of this slide. But before we put up the statistics, let me tell you about this fetus viability term. That is the term, and I have it in quotes, because that's the term that Roe v. Wade uses from the 1973 Supreme Court decision. Basically, what they came up with is that anything before 26 weeks, you can abort a baby. Anything after 26 weeks, you can't, or it should be at least a state's rights issue. And the reason that they give for the 26 weeks is fetus viability. Is the fetus, they don't want to call it a baby, is the fetus viable outside of the womb? And they thought that 26 weeks was the time that a fetus, a baby, could live outside of the womb. And so that's where they drew the line. Interesting enough, listen to this. In 1992, science got a little bit more better. And in 1992, there was a Supreme Court case called Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and they backed the the 26 weeks up to 23. Well, let me tell you, I'd hate to be a baby between 1973 and 1992 in between 23 and 26 weeks. You see how science changes? But God's word does not ever change. His law is the standard. But that's where it exists right now at 23 weeks. Fetus viability. But what I'm going to show you in these three statistics is that in the womb, you see individuality of the child and you see forms of life in the child. Listen to this one. 18 days after conception. 18 days. By the way, some women don't even know that they're pregnant 18 days after conception. Most do. Some don't. 18 days after conception, the heart is beating. But listen to this. This is even more remarkable to me with the baby's own blood. This isn't the woman's blood pumping through this baby. It is their own blood. Well, I see this on Dateline, so I know it's true. When they want to find out who done it, 
what do they use? DNA evidence? Blood evidence? It is the baby's own personal blood and DNA, which shows individuality apart from the mother. Listen to this one. 42 days after conception, brain is coordinating movements and brain waves detected. What I find interesting about this is that when somebody is hooked up to a machine that is pumping their own heart, a machine that is breathing for them, you know what the doctors do to try to find out if this person is going to live after they have taken off the machine? They detect for brain waves. Wait, 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 wait. If this is what we do outside of the womb, we check people's heart, we check for brain waves. If this is what we do outside of the womb, why would we not detect life inside the womb the same way? Why is it a different standard for detecting life outside versus inside? Somebody needs to answer that question for me. Between eight and 10 weeks, the baby has fingerprints. I also see this on Dateline, so I know this is true too. When they want to find who done it, they use fingerprints, which no other human being has the same fingerprint. These three statistics either show the individuality, individuality apart from the mother, or life. But we didn't even need science to tell us that there was life in the womb. In Genesis chapter 25, I'm just going to quote the first two, and then we'll hop over to Luke 1. In fact, be turning to Luke chapter 1. But in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 22, you remember Jacob and Esau are described as children in that passage. The children were wrestling with each other. Well, what's interesting about that word children is that's the same Hebrew word that is used for children outside the womb as used inside. And what skeptics, skeptics have said about that is, well, they didn't have the vocabulary uh, uh, of fetus or zygote or whatever term they use. If you understand that the scripture's inspired, that it came from God, listen, I'm pretty sure God's vocabulary is doing okay. Now, I'm pretty sure that if God uses the same term for children outside the womb as he used inside, that that's exactly what God meant to say. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41 and 44, remember Elizabeth is talking about John the baptizer? leaping in her womb, but the term that is described, uh, the term that is used to describe John is the term baby. Again, the same Greek word that is used of babies outside the womb. But the one that I want you to focus on is in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Listen to this. Luke chapter 1, verse 36. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived what? A son. Conceived a son. Do you know how scientifically accurate that is? That at the moment of conception, when the 23 chromosomes from the mom and the 23 chromosomes from the dad meet and they form life, at that very moment, gender is determined. And isn't it interesting that a gender term is used in conception? Wow. I said earlier that the question comes down to one question. Is what is in the womb a human being? Unfortunately, that's only for about 98% of people. There are a few radicals who will say that what is in the womb is life, that the unborn is a person, is a human being, but because they cannot grab their rights, because they cannot take a hold of their rights, they do not deserve to be protected. 
I see some of you shaking your head like that's the most unbelievable thing. Or, it's unbelievable to us because of what we believe. And yet that was just espoused by a tomb builder named Hillary Clinton last week on Meet the Press, just a week ago today. She said the unborn person, what, 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 what'd she say? The unborn person, she admitted that the unborn was a person and said that they are not afforded rights under the Constitution. And the way the reasoning goes is this. Because they can't take a hold of their rights, because they can't take advantage of their own rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, their rights don't deserve to be protected. Because they can't take a hold of their own rights, and the woman can, her rights come before the children's. Tomb building. Tomb building. But I know a lot of Christians that are tomb builders. Don't be one. The principle of Scripture, the principle way back in the Old Testament stretched through the New, is that God expects His people to defend people who cannot protect themselves. Defend the vulnerable. Defend the weak. Defend those who cannot stand up for themselves. Listen to these scriptures. And by the way, this is, what Jesus, this is the way Jesus taught from the Old Testament. He would often take a principle, like David eating the showbread, and then he would apply it to the Sabbath. Or David or Jesus would, would quote from, from God at the burning bush saying, I am the God of Abraham, and then he would take that principle and apply it to life after death. Listen to these principles and just apply them to the issue of abortion. Listen to this. Open your mouth for the, for the mute, for all the rights of all who are destitute. Can I misread it to make a point a little stronger? Open your mouth for the mute, for the right of life, oops, for the right of life who are destitute. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of life, oops, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. What's the principle? These are people who can't fight for themselves, who can't stand up for themselves. Rescue the unborn. Oops. Rescue the unborn. Or those who are being taken away to death. You see, when you apply these to the issue of abortion, you see the Bible, the Bible isn't silent on this issue. Not for a second. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. If you say, behold, we didn't know this. If you make an excuse of why you didn't stand up for the unborn, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Please get out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. You know, the... The entire gospel story is about God standing up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. That's what the entire gospel story is about. And that person was me and you. After we sinned, after we separated ourselves from God, we could not stand up for ourselves. We could not stand before God and be saved. So God stood up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. And he interceded with his own son. And if there was ever a reason to stand up for the vulnerable, it's because God did it for you.
if you're subject to the gospel call, and you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ today for the forgiveness of your sins, we bid you to come. As together we stand and sing.